champion change. So this is one of my favorite. I don't have a lot of time here, but I love change. When I was a, a, the chaplain uh, in Osan, the 51st uh, fighter wing, one of the, the greatest things I had was to go into a team. It was a pretty, a fair loss team, 15 or so, counting our contractors. Uh, and uh, we had to clean up a lot of things. We had to fix a lot of things that were broken, unfortunately. And so we were just going right ahead. And one of my, I'll never forget, one of my enlisted people, I went around the room because leaders are transparent. Leaders ask for feedback. And I went to one of my team. I said, what do you think? How am I doing? What can we do better? And I went around the room to each of them. And then no one was, oh, sir, you're the greatest. You know, this is, this is. And then one tech sergeant said, sir, if I can be honest. I said, please be honest. And then everybody cringes and say, oh, boy, we know this guy is going to be honest. And I was ready for it because that's what leaders do. We take it. And he said, sir, your change is like riding a speedboat. He said, except you're driving a speedboat, and we're like the buoys in the back just riding along. <laughs> I learned from that. General Pletcher, General Pesha, I said, wow, they're right. I'm a visionary, I'm creative, innovative, I want change, I want to make things happen, but what about those I'm leading? Am I going too fast? This was about eight years ago. Am I going too fast for everyone else? He was right. I need to slow down, bring the whole team on board, and say, let's make the change together. Let's believe in the change together. So that is important to know. So prepare for the change, create the vision, and so forth. But man, we rocked the chapel world. We rocked the base. It was awesome. The commander, quote unquote, says, you guys, this team set the place on fire. And, and it made a resilient team. That's the whole key. All right, go ahead. Next slide. And I'm not going to spend too much time, but this is uh, General... Uh, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., his dad was senior. His dad was an Army general, one star. General Davis became the first two star of African descent in the Air Force. Uh, not only that, when he was a little kid, uh, this person took him up in a plane at Bowling Air Force Base, or Air Force Base, the story goes, and put in him the love to fly, flying. But again, Remember Tuskegee Airmen, he was the leader of the Tuskegee Airmen. He found out he couldn't fly when he came into the armed forces. In fact, he went to West Point. In fact, he was the only person of African descent at West Point at the time. He was the number four in the long history of West Point at that time. And all the other three happened in the 1800s. And he came in 1932, graduated in 1936. Listen to this. No one talked to him. They isolated him. They kept him on the side. They only talked to him about commands that they needed to give him to get the mission done. He was undaunted. He said, I'm not quitting. And he graduated as number 35 out of a class of 276 with nobody talking to you. Socially isolated. But he wouldn't quit. He became the great leader. In fact, listen, I know my time is out, but he became a war hero. He fought in World War II, led the Tuskegee Airmen to, as I said, gallantry, uh, Silver Star recipient, and all of the awards and accolades you can imagine. And then he fought in Korean War. Watch this, a person who was told you can't fly. Then he fought in the Vietnam War. He was the commander of the 51st Fighter Wing. Whoa, anybody 51st? No. All right, yes, he was one of our commanders, yes. And so, uh, here's the guy who was told you can't do it. Retired as a three-star general. Then uh, President Clinton said, you know, this is not right. You should have been a four-star. And gave him his fourth star. Wow, amazing. And this is what I'm talking about. He said, look, I love this. The privilege of being, what did he call himself? An American. That's what we are. That's my foot stomp. We are Americans. It belongs to those who are brave enough to fight for them. That's what we want to be. We don't want to look at people in terms of ethnicity and what we call race, although we are one human race. But we want to look at people as Americans. That's my nationality, American. Proud to be an American. All right. So when you look at adversity, you ask yourself, what can I learn? 
What can come out of this? What lessons for my future? Did I develop any strengths as a result? And that's what resilient leaders do as we go through change. And this was a change maker.